Okay, I think we're gonna get started. Uh, Regina, you ready? Yeah, let's, we can start. Yeah, okay, so welcome everyone to uh, Buffalo Street Books' Week of YA, where we have seven YA author events um, over seven days. Um, and I think we're really proud that all the books we're featuring are from authors who are, who are debut authors and can imagine it's not, it's a difficult time to have a book coming out during this particular time. Um, but I'm so excited to, that we get to host uh, the author of one of my favorite books of this year um, and give you a, a little sneak peek of a book that comes out next month. So you don't have to wait too long uh, to read it. Um, but I am very excited to be welcoming uh, Shweta Takrar today, uh, author of Star Daughter. Um, I, do you want to say a few words about yourself and about uh, Star Daughter as well? Um, sure. So I absolutely love fantasy and YA. And so when I decided I was going to start writing seriously, I knew that I wanted to do that, except I wanted to write the stories that I hadn't had growing up. And so I knew I was going to write about Desi characters and bring in Hindu mythology and just make it as fun as something like Lainey Taylor might write, as fun and lush and imaginative. Yeah, that definitely comes across with the, the Lainey Taylor writing, which is like some of my favorite writing. Um, Regina, do you want to take the next one? Yeah, so um, what what first got you into fantasy to begin with? Was there like a specific book or something like that? Honestly, I know this probably sounds twee, but it's true. I, I believe in magic. I've always believed in magic. When I was younger, I could feel it. And for me, I mean, I like reading quote unquote realistic books too, but, the, but I, for me, there was never any question that I wouldn't write something with magic in it. All my stories, all my short stories have it. My poems have it. Uh, anything I write going forward is going to have it because for me, there's just something so wonderful about the thought of the numinous and all the things that might be just past the corner of your eye, if only you can look fast enough to to see it, to catch it. And and I also, like I was saying earlier, I want to I want to do that with um, with Hindu mythology and because we have so many amazing stories. I mean, I don't even know most of them, but like they're just, there's so much rich material to work with and, and so many interesting characters and cool concepts. So that pair perfectly with magic. Cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things about, you know, reading early copies is sometimes they have author letters in them, um, like at the beginning and, um, your author letter was just such a del delight to read, to see how you wanted to, to write stories that featured, you know, characters that weren't being represented, you know, across, across literature. Um, and one of the, you said one of the biggest influences um, for this book and uh, was in fact uh, Neil Gaiman's Stardust. So can you talk about how that influenced not only this book, but, but you as a, as a fantasy writer? Sure, and now I'm wishing I had found where it was on my shelf. It's, it's somewhere here. I would have grabbed it to say, this is a copy that I found in 2002, was it? 2000, I think so. It was a long time ago. I found it in a, so, so Stardust by uh, Neil Gaiman and Charles Best is an illustrated novel for adults. Mm -hmm. And one of the plot lines is that a star gets hit out of the sky. She gets knocked out of the sky and she falls down into a fairy realm. And when she, and when she gets there, she's actually a person. And I just loved that so much. I was so taken with it that I just, I read it over and over. And then when the movie came out in 2007, I watched it and I liked it, not as much as the book, but I liked it. But it started, that was around the time that I had decided to start writing seriously. And I realized, huh, stars, if, they, if they're gonna be people, if they're gonna look like human beings, they should look like all of us. Star doesn't have to have white skin. And so I decided I was going to write a short story about a girl whose mother was from a Hindu constellation. That's all I knew. And then pretty soon I figured out that she was going to have to go on a quest to find her mother up in the sky. And I thought, uh-oh, uh, you kind of can't fit a quest into a short story. I guess this is going to be a novel. <laughs> and then it just went from there. 
that. Yeah, that's great. But um, as for how that influenced me, I just really loved the, the exactly what I said I tried to do myself, that Neil clearly just brought in so much fun stuff. Like he just didn't, he didn't hold back with what might be possible in a land of magic. And that was the same thing that I wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that definitely comes across. And I, I'm ashamed to say I haven't yet read the book. I'd love to find the illustrated edition, but I remember being dragged to the theater to see the movie and really loving it. Um, but I'm sure as, you know, as a big reader now, I, uh, I'd love the book even more. Um, Uh, what kind of research did you have to do with the book, uh, do for the book? Because uh, you did mention that you wanted to include a lot of Hindu mythology. So how much of that was just like stories that you already knew or grew up with? And like, how much astrology did you have to learn? Oh my goodness. That's, that is actually a really good question. Because if you think about something like, you know, Celtic or British fairy folklore, we're steeping in it here in the West. Like everybody's heard of fairies, even if they're not familiar with the actual folklore. But I, I, I worried because there's this idea that there's an original of any story that we've told over, you know, through, through folklore. And there's not, like folklorists would tell you, there's no way to find what the original was. That doesn't even make sense. So there, there are going to be a million versions of any story. And, but what, but what, the reason I was worried was because since we haven't already had enough representation of Hindu mythology here in the West, people are going to take what I wrote and think it is all true to the, the source material. And that's not true. I made stuff up. I'm trying to think how to talk about it in a way that's not spoiler. Uh, everything about the Starry Court, I made up. I did have to do some research. A friend of mine, I had to ask her father who, he's a pujari, uh, I mean, he's a scholar rather of, um, of Hindu mythology. And, and I had to ask him about the nakshatras, the constellations and, and look at a book because I didn't know very much at all. And I, there's still so much I don't know. Like Vedic astrology is a whole tradition that people often use when they're deciding to get married. They check charts and make sure that they would be compatible and what would be a good day to get married and all that stuff. And I just barely dipped my toes in there. But even otherwise, like I was saying, there's, you know, Hindu myth is so rich and there's so many regions of South Asia and there's so many different traditions under the Hindu umbrella that stories differ. There are different stories from place to place. I honestly don't know the bulk of them. I wish I did. I hope one day I can delve into them more. What I drew on mostly was stories I had grown up with in comics called Amritithra Katha. They are child versions of the, of the old stories in, a, in comic book form, so they're easy to digest. And, uh, and so I, I drew on some of those. I did do some research on my own. I looked up stories over the years to be able to just become more familiar with them. And let's see, I don't, again, I don't want to spoil it. But when, when she still gets to the starry core, or when she gets to the heavenly realm, Swerglok, she has to answer questions about some stories. And two of those I took from actual mythology and one I made up myself. But also a couple of the gods feature briefly in the novel as well, Hindu and Vedic gods. And of course, I didn't make them up. So it was definitely a mix of research and, uh, and invention. Yeah. And it's, it's really, it's really wonderful to hear you say that about, you know, we had um, our author on Monday said the exact same thing about the making up, uh, about taking sort of influence from stories from non-Western culture and people automatically thinking that it's true. And, you know, that, so that, that really stands out to yeah, me. Yeah, because um, I've seen reviews that say things like, this book didn't give me enough, cult teach me enough about culture or, or whatever. And I'm thinking, but it's a novel, you know, you wouldn't expect this of, a white author, so why would you put that expectation here? Like, give us the same space to play. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and going off of the research process, I'm, I'm interested in the writing process. You know, how many drafts did you go through? Did you <laughs> plot or pants it? Um, <laughs> did, like, is this the, like, what does your writing environment look like, both, you know, metaphorically and physically? Are you in it right now? <laughs> yes, this is my, this is what my friend Grace calls my dreaming, well, I, I actually stole the term from her. My, this is my dreaming room, my writing space. And I've tried to fill it. You can't see everything, unfortunately, but I've tried to fill it with things that are very inspiring to me and make it create a magical sort of feel so that when I come in here, it's, you know, I'm, I'm less inclined to go on Twitter and fool around. Sorry, sorry, Stephanie, my editor, and, and actually get to work. But yeah, I, I really wanted to make it something that evoked the sense that i have been trying to create in, the, in my work to channel it. And, uh, and uh, oh, what was the other part of your question? Um, 
So what did the, the writing process look like? Uh, yes. Okay. The reason I started laughing, and I bet you anything my editor is laughing as well, this book took ultimately nine drafts. I started it in 2013, and I was completely pantsing it. And because of that, almost, like, like there's some concepts that are still there. The first journal entry is pretty much mostly the same. It's still there. Uh, but I had to start all over <laughs> because I, yeah, pantsing, uh, I'm really trying to become more of an outliner <laughs> going forward because pantsing results in a lot of thrown away material as you figure things out and realize, oh God, that didn't work at all. And what I thought I wanted to do wasn't what I wanted to do. But, but yeah, it took years. It took years. I, we sold the book in 2016, uh, right? Wait, no. Sorry, I got my agent in 2016. That's what I was going to say. And I think that was draft number six. Then we sold the book in 2018. And then I did two more revisions under editor Stephanie and then line edits and, and copy edits. So, by, and, and then finally first pass pages. So by the time it was done, it was in a lot of ways a very different book than what I had started with in 2013. But it still had the same original spark. Definitely has lots and lots of sparks in it. Um, Starlight, haha. -ha. <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. So, uh, how many other manuscripts have you written, or how many? Um, you know, usually people don't get their first manuscript published, so I imagine. Well, this wasn't mine either. It's actually my second. I had the same problem with the with the first one, where I kept having to start over and redraft and redraft and redraft. So, yeah. It, but so it, even if I only technically wrote one before this book, I wrote it many times and then I wrote this book many times. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's always, it's always interesting to me, to me to find out that like a debut book isn't always the first book that an author has ever written. Um, and you know, one of my favorite things about, about this book, and I just like oh, love the cover so you can all appreciate how gorgeous it is, um, is the characters. I mean, the, the the world is so fascinating the prose is incredibly beautiful but the characters are also incredibly interesting and um and so some of them are you relate to them on so many different levels and i'm wondering you know did you have a favorite character to write like was there a character who was your favorite to write but is that also your favorite character overall or was maybe your favorite character the hardest one to write you know that is that is a good question because it's really hard to answer <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm glad that you felt like the characters were relatable. One thing that, before I answer that, one thing that I was really trying to do was make, and, and, it, and uh, Stephanie helped me a lot with this in the final drafts of honing, really honing what we were trying to do as Sheetal, the main character, uh, that I really wanted her to be magical, but also really human and make her suffer some of the things that here we suffer here on in mundane life so to speak and and so that she wasn't she wasn't just dropped from the heavens you know she was she was born and raised here on earth and in america in new jersey and everything that that would mean and so she would also be an entry point to this other stellar celestial culture because you would be seeing it through her eyes and so hopefully that would be relatable and i also really wanted like female friendship is a big deal to me and I really like I I really wanted that to be an important part of the book, and so I'm yeah I'm really pleased with how Sheetal's and Minol's friendship turned out, and and but it was like there was never any question that Minol is always going to be have her back. That was not going to be one of the things that Sheetal struggled with. She has many other problems in the book, but it wasn't going to be her friendship. And as for uh, hardest, let me start with hardest hardest character to write. I can't name him. But I will say there's somebody in the later part of the book and we had to think about how to give him enough, enough uh, not personality, but enough dimension that he didn't come across as one note. And because ultimately you really do want all characters to feel like they are tell they're the star of their own story. If they were the ones telling the, if it was from their point of view, that you, they feel complex enough that you would believe them. And so I, so I had to struggle with that. And again, my wonderful editor and I bounced ideas off each other until I figured out how to do it. And as for favorite characters, uh, well, there were a few. I, I really enjoyed writing Shizel's auntie, <laughs> Razi Kofoy, because 
my, so I, so I had, I, I stopped taking harp lessons for now anyway, but I was taking harp lessons for 10 years. And one time my teacher told me that she had, she knew somebody who was a serial harp buyer. She would buy a harp and she would decide she didn't like it. And she would get another harp. And I was like, what? Who does this? And then and I thought, the other oh, you know, do? or well, I, I'm assuming she sold them. I don't know. But like, I was just thinking, but you know, a harp is an investment. It's a pretty substantial investment. And I'm not even talking about the big pedal harps that you see in concerts, just like the one I have, which is a uh, folk harp. You know, it's, it's still a substantial investment. So to just be like, eh, that wasn't for me. And I thought, that's so fascinating. And then I thought, I need to put that in my book. And so, so Rajikanti became a serial couch buyer. <laughs> that was super fun to write. And the harp sisters at the night market were super fun to write as well. I mean, honestly, Almost everybody was really fun to write, even if I struggled with figuring out how to get them on the page in the way that I wanted. Yeah, that's so great. And I, I loved the night market. Like, there's just like so much like just beautiful like imagery and just locations. Um, thank you. On that Earth was and in the sky. Um, thank you. Like, I, you know, that is absolutely like I said. This book, in so many ways, for me, is magical wish fulfillment. I wrote the magical night market that I want to go to. I, you know, I wrote the the celestial court that I would want to visit and so on and so forth. And, and by the way, if anybody's curious about um, the night market, that's in you, if you go to my website later, my background is an illustration I had done of the night market by the amazing artist Esma Kazi. Excited to check that out. That is very exciting. Um, yeah, those, those descriptions were just delicious. Uh, and you. I wanted to say, Ooh, I really, so hungry at the beginning. <laughs> I really loved the relationship between Cheadle and Mino. Like that was so refreshing to see them and their relationship as it was throughout the book and like not, you know, not ever like turning catty or being mean to each other. And like, I just, you don't see that often enough. So I really like that. Thank you. And that means, that means so much to me because that's exactly why I wrote it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to know for any teen budding teen writers that are listening to us. Did you write a lot as a teenager? And um, would you have any particular advice to give to teen writers? Well, I'm going to tell you something funny. For some reason, I got it into my head that I wasn't creative. And I'm not sure where that came from. Because looking back, I made stuff my whole life. I came up with stories my whole life. I had these rich imaginary worlds from the time that I was tiny you know, just like my, my daydreams, my little stories for myself. And then, so it's just, it's just funny because yes, so I, I technically was always a storyteller. And then in high school, I wrote, uh, I wrote, I didn't know, it was, I mean, I didn't, I'd never heard of fan fiction back then. I'm 41 now. So when I was in high school, that was, that was a while ago. We're talking in the late nineties, but the, I wrote fan fiction of the legend of Zelda. I, I wrote fan fiction of all things of the street fighter video game, along with my sister. <laughs> and we, I never finished either of those. And I also wrote, I started, I had, I remember I had 35,000 novel words of a novel and an original novel, and that didn't go anywhere. And I tried writing a chapter and sent it to, well, what was the original company? I don't think it was Wizards of the Coast at the time, but I wrote, I wrote what I hoped would be a Forgotten Realms novel. And I got a very nice ex, ex, a rejection letter that explained why it didn't work. And at that time I was like, eh, but now I looking back, I was like, wow, they took the time to tell me why that didn't work. That's amazing. But, but yeah, so I've, I've always written. I, and I just decided to start taking it seriously in my mid twenties. That was when I looked around and I realized, you know, for example, I adore my friend Holly Black's work. I adore it. And, and I thought, but where, where's the, you know, the, the Hindu equivalent of this, where, where's the folklore, like for Buddhist folklore, Buddhist mythology, where is it? I don't, where are people who look like me? And I, so I decided that I would, I would uh, write those things. And I'm saying this because I want teenagers, any, anyone who's interested in writing to hear this. I got told back then in 2006, 2007, I got told many times, no one would ever want to read that. I should just self-publish because there was no interest in this. And I want to say that's clearly not true. Oh yeah. And everybody, yeah, exactly. Everybody deserves to have their story told. And our, our canon of literature needs to expand. Our idea of what is okay to publish needs to expand. And we need to allow for all kinds of voices, all kinds of marginalized voices. I wanna hear from all of you, my teen writers. I wanna hear, I wanna see the beautiful stuff you come up with. And so my advice to you is figure out what it is you have to say. And also what would be fun for you to write? 
and combine those things. Start there. And then, then you can hone your voice because you're going to, you know, you're, it, it will take a little while to figure out your voice as opposed to the voices of the books that you read and love. But the more you practice and the more feedback you get from other people, the more you will figure out this is what I want to say and this is how I want to say it. So well said. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, now, now I have a question for me and other library lovers. Um, I'm a library lover. I, would love I hope everybody uh, who likes books is also a library lover. Um, I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about the vision for the library that you created and your singing decimal system. Okay, so in the Starry Court in Star Daughter, there is a magical library. Of course there's a magical library. <laughs> How would there not be? Well, my husband plays, it's, it's funny because I'm married to a white guy and I play like an Irish harp. And he plays the Indian uh, Esraj or Dilruba, which is also in Star Daughter. And he studies with a master teacher, uh, Shafat Alu Khan. And he, and he learns rags. They are really beautiful songs that I encourage everyone to look up and there are rags for different times of the day. And so I got inspired that it would be really lovely to have, since there's so much music in the Starry Court to begin with, and I'm, again, I'm trying to think how to speak in, in vague terms so it's not to spoil anything, but there's a lot of music in, in the Starry Court. So I thought it would be really beautiful if to find the kind of book you were looking for, you had to sing, you had to figure out what kind of rag it would be under. Would it be a morning rag? A, uh, you know, an afternoon rag, an evening rag, a noon rag, like where would it be? And then you had to sing. And that part, wherever, that part of the library was color coded to match that time of day. And then you would find your book. It would light up after you sang for it. So awesome. Yeah, that's so creative. It's like nothing I would ever think of, but so delightful. Thank you. Not well, a that's shushing library though. <laughs> nope, nope, nope. <laughs> Though I think she still did get in trouble for being loud in there at some point, but, but yeah. <laughs> but I wanted to add, that's one more piece of advice come to think of it uh, for, for writers of any age. Uh, I, was, I remember I was once really worried that I would never, after my first manuscript, I would never have another idea. And so I asked Delia Sherman, who's a, you know, a, one of our great fairy godmothers of the, of the fantasy and science fiction field. I said, Delia, what if I never have another idea? And she looked at me and she said, oh, honey, the way to get more ideas is to practice training your brain to get ideas. <laughs> Look around at the things that inspire you and practice and, and, and reward your brain every time it gives you something. Be like, oh, yes, more of that. And you will eventually, it will come naturally. And that's exactly what happened with me. So, so I think you could do it if you wanted to. <laughs> Um, so actually my next question is about inspiration since so much of the book is also about inspiration. Um, and I was wondering how your process of, of inspiration relates to the one that you write about in the book. Well, I wish somebody sprinkled me with stardust and I, <laughs> I, I could just do it. No, unfortunately it seems to be a little more haphazard. I will get, I'm a very visual person as you can probably tell from the description. So I will get an image and I will try to figure out what the story would be to go with that image. And I, I have a Pinterest board. I have one for Star Daughter. I have one for the novel that I'm working on right now because seeing, actually seeing things, beautiful things that are in the, in the neighborhood of what I'm trying to do allows me to then start, opens up my imagination. And I start to, to get wonderful ideas. Uh, sometimes talking to other people helps. Sometimes desperation helps, right, Stephanie? <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's definitely, I, for me, being a very visual person, oh, oh my goodness, and music as well. I have to have music when I'm, when I'm writing because it evokes feeling, in, the feeling that I'm trying to convey. And it allows me to get in the headspace, or the, I should say the imagination space of creating. Mm -hmm. So yes, for me, definitely. And also, one thing that I did, at least pre-COVID and hope to do after, is uh, I would go uh, occasionally to little shops that were just full of beautiful things. And I would just, it was like, I felt like I was eating on, you know, not, not physically eating, but I was devouring all this stuff, just filling my well every time I would go into a shop like that, or I would read a book like that, or I would read a, watch a movie or something, just fill, refilling the well so that there was more fuel for my imagination to draw on. Yeah, yeah. And 
going off of that, um, the this question just popped into my head, you know, and a little bit of, I guess, research. Did you go anywhere, like, while you were writing this book? I mean, did you go to, I mean, of course, no market. You could go to whatever be as magical as the one you created, but did you go to markets or you, like, you know, presses you describe? Interestingly, interestingly, no. I, looking back, I don't know why that is, but yeah, I, not really. It, it was more, except for, like, the little shops I mentioned just wandering into or, you know, random places I would find. It really was mostly finding beautiful images on the internet or just whatever came out of here and here, so. Yeah, yeah definitely. And um, going sort of back to, there's a, a lot of uh, both Regina and I, as we were reading this, we're, there's a lot of talk about music and music is a huge element of this book. And you've talked about being a heart player um, a little bit, but as we were reading it, we were just like, you know, we were just like, we have to ask you, are you a musician? Because like, I feel like you have to be a musician to be able to write about music in such as sort of like an eloquent and like gorgeous ways you, at, that you did so um oh, thank you I have to confess I am not a good heart player my teacher would be like well that's what you get for not practicing <laughs> <laughs> so but like did you um where did your introduction to music come from were you always did you always start off playing the harp or was there no 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 I started I started just on a whim honestly in 2010 when of all things I had gone to a steampunk production of Twelfth Night and it was a cool enough play but but what I came, what I was like oh, about was there was a, somebody who just had this tiny harp which actually isn't practical at all now that I know but it was just like this like this big and they just kept strumming the strings and I was like what is that and then we got to go backstage because it was a small production and we knew one of the actresses in it and I was just like can I touch that this is so cool and then suddenly I felt like this voice inside that was like, you need to take harp lessons. I was like, I don't know anything about music. I mean, I've always loved listening to music, but like, I don't know anything about theory or, you know, I don't, I don't know how to read sheet music, anything. And I found it, I found a harp teacher local to me. I, she met me at the local harp store. We leased a harp and later I ended up buying a different one. And I took lessons for 10 years and I still don't know how to read sheet music because she told me that, that, that I could, that was a skill I could acquire later. And she thought it was more important that I learned by ear. Wow. But you did mention um, your husband's a musician. Yes, he is much better than me. He um, actually, he years ago, he music. was in, uh, oh, go ahead. I was just going to, did he influence your, your writing of music in the uh, book? I guess, yeah, well, I mean, because of him, the, the, you know, the dogs are in there because I would listen to them and I, so definitely, yes. But I'm just laughing because, yeah, he's definitely way, 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 way better musician than me and he's been doing that for a lot longer too, so. Um, I just want to say really quickly for those who are watching, um, I did receive a couple of questions via email for audience questions, but if you guys want to start um, with putting your, your questions in the chat, um, you can go ahead and start doing that. Um, but I'm going to have to move on to a question that the bookseller in me has to ask every single time. And that is, we've all been in quarantine for like three, four months. Um, so I feel like months, it's it been difficult. 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, what is time? Um, you know, for some of us, it might have been more difficult to, to muster up the, the strength to really read, but did you read anything during quarantine that, that you enjoyed, you would recommend? It took me, and I want to say this because I know other people are struggling with this too, I love reading. You know, that's, that's obvious, I, I hope. I love reading. I mean, hello, this is part of my library. But for some reason, when the, when the pandemic hit the States and we had to lock down, I know a lot of us just weren't able to read. And I was one of them. I had a really difficult time. And only recently have I been able to get back to it. And so let me see if I can. I pulled a couple uh, recommendations for, of um, uh, recent books that I have. And, and I want to name a couple read alikes too for people who are interested. But a couple recent books that I, I read and loved. Uh, can you see this? Is, is the glare okay? Um, Another gorgeous Charlie Bowater yes. cover. Yes, <laughs> Forest of Souls by Laurie M. Lee, which also has a wonderful female friendship, I have to say. Uh, this is, I, I guess there's a disclaimer, this is my editor sibling, but her, I don't care, her book is amazing. It's the Falling in Love montage. Her name is Kira Smith, and it is a, the, an amazing girl-girl uh, rom-com with, uh, with just this wonderful depth to it so it's both funny and just you know heartbreaking in some ways it's, it's really wonderful I, I loved both of those uh, right now i am reading or listening to roshni chokshi's audiobook uh 
uh, once more upon a time while I cook. I'm a very slow cook, so I tend to listen to audiobooks while I cook. So I'm listening to that. And, uh, and I wanted to suggest, oh, and I also started The, the Princess Will Save You by Sarah Henning, oh, which is a, a, a reimagining of The Princess Bride, oh. which I'm 100% here for. Yes. And, uh, and also as quick read-alikes for Stardaughter, I wanted to pick a couple of fun, uh, fun books off my shelf. And if this one will come out, then okay. So we've got, we've got uh, again Roshni. We've got Roshni Tokshi's *The Star Touched Queen*. Uh, when Roshni and I met, we were both delighted to find out not only did we have similar interests in writing styles, but we both had magical night markets slash bazaars in our books. <laughs> so that was really cool. Um, my agent sibling, Cat Toes, Wicked Fox, which one. has there and how can you? I mean, sorry, Gumiho and how can you beat that? Uh, then Cindy Pond has a lovely book called Serpentine and a sequel, which is Sacrifice. And she also has uh, snake demons, which are like our Buddhist and Hindu nags, that they're half human, half snake, which is always going to, I'm always going to be there for that. So yes, those would be current suggestions for, or well, I should say suggestions for current and more backlist books. Awesome. I have my CBR just grew. In. Um, are there any upcoming books uh, that you're really excited for that haven't yet been published? Oh my gosh, of course, because because you asked me, I'm forgetting everything. Um, there, oh goodness, uh, yes, there's so many. There's so many, and I can't think of any, and I'm really embarrassed. Uh, can we, <laughs> we can come back, back to that I question? Can give you a question if you want to come back to it. Okay. <laughs> no. Um, so speaking of, I guess, books. Um, I mean, we're already talking about books, but the cover is so stunning um i mean as, as someone who's not just who not just works in a bookstore but who's just a fan of books and involved in bookish fandoms i can I, as soon as um the this cover was revealed i was like that's a charlie bowater cover uh who's a, this phenomenal artist who does lots of um book covers for fantasy novels so i'm wondering how much input did you have on this cover? Um, did you see multiple things from multiple artists? Did you just know? Of, did you just know of Charlie? And wanted, like I want her to do my cover. Um, how much input did you have in this? Because it's it's always so interesting because sometimes we have authors who say that they have they had absolutely no input to their cover, and others who said they were involved in every aspect of the process. I'm really lucky, and here I have to give a shout out to my editor Stephanie and the the entire Harper team because. They, so, so when I, when Stephanie wanted to buy the book, I had a phone call with her and I explained to her how much, how important it was to me that the representation be made foremost. Uh, how, I'm trying to think how to explain my, that I didn't want it to get hidden away, but I also wanted, I also wanted the book because I wrote it to be a fun book. It's not supposed to be at all about the oppression of being brown. I, you know, I wanted to write a fun, magical adventure. So I wanted the book to also be marketed that way. And Stephanie said she understood and that was really important to her as well. And that was one of the reasons that I was absolutely thrilled to take her offer. And then when it came time to start planning the cover, she emailed me and asked if I had any, any ideas. And I did. I said I could actually picture a really beautiful text treatment, but because we still don't have anywhere near enough visual representation of marginalized people. I really would love to see Sheetal on the cover. And she said, that makes complete sense to me. And she went back to, and she asked if I had any, any covers that I liked that I could send along. And I made a big list and she sent them along to the design team. And in the meantime, they had picked Charlie. I didn't have any say in, who, in, uh, in that, but I was very delighted to hear that we were working with Charlie. And then when I saw the first sketch, I was blown away. And I got to give lots of feedback on, uh, on, on really making, like honing her face, she's little face and making her look really daisy. All the jewelry, the fact that she's holding the Moonlight Lotus for Bindi, that was all me. And they, they were just so thrilled to get all the feedback and incorporate it. And, and then Corinna Luck did that amazing, uh, the, she made that font, basically. She made it for this book. And, and she gave all those gorgeous, the halo, all the details. I'm... I'm never going to get over the fact that I won the cover lottery. I'm, I, and, and for it to be, I mean, it brings me to tears even now that my brown girl book got this cover and I've been getting messages from people. Even today I got one that was just like, I 
have been, I, I've never thought I would get a book like this where I'm on the cover, that this is going to be about me. And, and I was just like, this is why I'm writing. You know, this is why I ignored all those people who told me that no one would ever want to read this, stuff like this, because that's nonsense and everybody deserves to be yes. seen. So to be seen in, in this incredibly beautiful way to mm -hmm. where she's so clearly Daisy, she thought she's so clearly magical that, yeah, I, I'm, I will never get over it. Yeah, no, it's stunning. And I, and I completely understand what, what you were saying about the beginning is that you wanted, I think from what I understand, you wanted, you know, people are walking around in a bookstore. I mean, I think of uh, and Barnes and Nobles coming to my mind just because they have like that, like the new teen like table that people were to walk by and they would see right on the cover who they were reading about and who was going to be the star of that story. Um, and so especially, you know, I think brown girls, you know, such as myself who, you know, don't get to for the longest time didn't get to see themselves not just on covers but in books in general get to walk by the table and see it and see themselves and immediately know to pick it up that they'll get to read a story where they're the star um and i think that that's just so incredible and i think it's and i'm so glad that that stephanie that the team at harper allowed you the opportunity like allowed you to sort of the opportunity to to make sure that that happened because it's just it's so wonderful um and i think now we should probably take some audience questions. Do we have a couple in the chat? Um, okay, Let's see, and I have some I need to open up on email. But the first one is what is a writing question? It, it is what is the most technically difficult aspect of writing that you practice or work hard to develop? Plotting. That does not come organically to me. I'm still learning how to do it. And I've been uh, turning to, and Stephanie was really good in helping me hone that in the, in the last drafts because uh, the bones were there. A lot of the great stuff was already there, but, but finishing weaving it together into a plot that worked was a challenge. And I definitely leveled up in revising because I felt like I finally internalized the structure of what a Western story looks like. And this is definitely told in a Western mode, right? I'm writing for a Western audience. I am a Western person myself. So, but I find, I feel like I finally internalized what that is, but yes, I'm still, I'm still learning how to plot. And so. uh, Regina, do you want to take the next one? Yeah. Uh, was writing the descriptions or illustrations difficult or easy for you? Well, as I said, I didn't have any say, I mean, I didn't do the illustration, Charlie did, but but the description, actually, I love playing with language. I love it so much. And that was the thing that I learned how to do. I had read other people's beautiful writing. And in 2007, I was like, that's what I want my voice to be. That's what it feels like it would be right. And so over the years, I honed it. And so I, I have so much fun doing it. I mean, even in the, when we wrote the first pass pages, and for everyone who doesn't know what that is, it's when your book is laid out to look like the actual book. It's in that, it's, in, it's set, typeset, it's got the pretty uh, chapter heading, decorations, whatever else, the page numbers, and you're reading it one last time for any last mistakes. I was still tweaking language even then because I just wanted, like that matters so much to me. So I, I don't find it hard at all. I, I love it. How, how do you hone that? Like, how do you hone a voice? That's fascinating to me. Well, like I, in my case, uh, like I said, I, I thought about what felt right for the kinds of stories that I knew I wanted to tell. And I just started playing, you know, I started playing and some of that stuff was overwrought. Some of it is what, what was what we would call purple prose. So personally, I think that sounds like it would be a beautiful thing, but uh, but yeah, I mean, it was, and I had to learn over time and it, getting people's feedback helped you, you know, they would be like, well, rein that in a bit here, or this doesn't really make sense. This is too vague. Or somebody gave me really wonderful advice one year about how, especially in something like a short story, but even in a novel, this, the imagery that you use should be consistent with the story that you're telling. So for example, Star Daughter has a lot of stellar imagery, right? And and that's one way that you can hone your voice by figuring out what you want to say and then how you want to say it and getting people's feedback so that you figure out more what also doesn't work, but also what feels right to you. Yeah, like you have some, I just want to say you have some of the most like excellent writing advice. I remember a, few years ago, a couple of years ago, there was this book published by Allie Carter it was like, dear Allie, how do I write a book? And like so many authors like contributed 
information to it. And I'm like, I wish you were in there. Oh, that's really sweet. <laughs> um, okay. So I have one question that was emailed to me. I think it's, it's a really great one. Um, and this one says, are there ever any compromises you find yourself having to make to make your story more accessible to non basey audiences? If so, how do you navigate those storytelling choices? If not, what's your rationale? And this is from an aspiring Daisy writer. That is a wonderful question because I think uh, from everything that, in, in fact, my friend, who, Mikey, who's in the audience here would, would say, would agree with me because he said this, that I have figured out how to make things accessible to an audience who doesn't, who doesn't come with familiar, already familiar. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me say that again an audience who's not already familiar with what I'm doing, with the source material that I'm working with, that I figured out how to make it accessible. And for me, the trick is weave it into the description, not as an info dump, absolutely not. Do not write things like chai tea or non bread or whatever, redundant stuff. Like that's, that's, that's making yourself talk down to, the, to, your, to your readers. Don't do that. Find a way to weave it in. And, and, and then, you know, trust that your readers are smart and trust your own writing ability and trust that your readers are smart enough to understand from context what something means. And then after that, if they still don't know, there is Google. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I, I'll say this in the book that I'm working on right now. I'm introducing more mythology. I, I, I can say that much at more Hindu mythology. And it's been interesting because I have to figure out how to weave in some of the actual stories because my, a lot of, you know, my non-Hindu readership and maybe not even some of them will know all these tales. So, but there's always a way to do it if you want to do it. Like I, I would never tell anybody stop, like, like stop yourself from writing the stuff that you want to write because you're afraid your audience won't follow. It's a matter of craft. If you hone your craft, you can get it across. Yeah, <laughs> more great advice. Um, okay, Regina, do you want to take the last audience yeah. question we have right now? So it says, I have to ask because it's one of my favorite things to think about. What one thing would you buy at the magical night market? Is this my editor? Yes. Stephanie, is that you? <laughs> I, because that, that's like the worst question in the world because I can't, I want to buy everything. Uh, uh, I put everything in there that I want. I want. So, um, uh, gosh. Uh, well, there's in one of my short stories, and, and this would also be in the night market, I just didn't mention it. Sure, Stephanie, I see you laughing there. Uh, not sorry. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I didn't mention in, in Star Daughter, but it's definitely in the night market, is a pearl that allows writers to reach forward in time and get the final draft of their work. <laughs> I would definitely buy that. Love that. Even if I had to give away a year of my life or something to buy it, I would buy that. That's okay. That's um, very amazing. It's great. Yeah, I, I would not be able to decide. Yeah, no, I, like I said, I, I mean, Everything Honestly, I in would, there, oh, right? right? Like, yes. just like I would never be able to leave the night market. Yep. yep. <laughs> um, okay. Yep. Um, and now back to some of the, and if we have time, we can take maybe some, a couple more questions at the end. Um, but back to some of our more, some of our questions. Um, and this has to do, you can do that in a bit, is what is next for you? Um, is, is your, do you have a new, do you have a new, another book coming up soon? Is it fantasy? Is it, um, is it in the same world as Star Daughter? Is it completely different? What can you what can you say about it? Yeah, this is a little bit tricky because we want to wait, obviously, until Star Daughter is out to, mm -hmm. to announce this. But there is a, a, I am working on a second book. It is another YA fantasy, and it does use a lot of Hindu mythology. I, and Stephanie has allowed me to say this much. It involves dreams and it involves nags, which are uh, which are um, beings from Hindu and Buddhist myth that are shapeshifters and they can take snake form, human form, or half snake, half human form. Wow. Stephanie, if you ever need bookseller blurbs, <laughs> hit me up. Um, or librarians. <laughs> yes, both. Um, and um, I have a, just a, another 
kind of going off of that another question is, um, you know, at the at the top of, of the arc, and I guess it is probably would be on the, the finished copy as well, you have a blurb from, from Holly Black, and you mentioned Holly Black earlier before, like, what does it feel like to have, like, I'm sure, you know, Holly Black is an author that you read from that you love as well, you've talked about her writing um, earlier, like, what is it, what does it feel like to have you know authors that you've read before who you've loved then read your book and and put to writing how much they love it well i get to go even a step deeper here because or a step further here because holly uh we're we're writing friends holly read draft three the competition is in there because holly suggested it when we were trying when i was trying to figure wow. out plotting. like she didn't know the form that the competition would take she just suggested I think about working a competition into it because as she put it, you want to keep raising, you want to give different stakes as you go along, raise the stakes. And, uh, and so, yes, she was, that was super helpful. She also gave me advice that I can't use here without, or I can't share here without spoiling, but, but there's a, uh, she said, she said one thing that she does is she takes big questions that she's wrestling with and she puts them into her work. And she suggested that I do the same thing. So something in there is, is that, and that's, I, I know it's very vague and I apologize, but, <laughs> and you know, it's, it's wonderful because Holly is, and I are going to be in conversation for my lunch party and uh, my virtual lunch party. And she ha had to read the final version of Star Daughter. So I'm super curious to see what she thinks from how it, how it evolves from draft three to this final one. Wow, that's something, to, that's something to think about. Um, and and to answer your question, it feels amazing. <laughs> yeah, and also I'm sure saying for fans of Neil Gaiman and Lady Taylor on the back, saying if you like Stardust, pick up this one. That's even better. <laughs> um, uh, Regina, do you want to take the last? Yeah. One? So you you mentioned um, your virtual launch party. What does release month look like for you in this time of of pandemic? <laughs> And, and well, what can we do to support you? Well, let's see. First of all, that's a, that's a really nice question. Thank you. I guess just, just talk about the book. Uh, I, I want it to be successful, not just, for, I mean, obviously for me, but not just for me, but also because I want, I really want publishing as a whole to, to see that marginalized authors aren't going anywhere. Our stories need to be told. You know, they, we deserve the same chances that our white, white uh, straight authors, cis authors, and so forth uh, get. And we deserve to, you know, write all the book, all the different kinds of books too, and and like I said, I, I had been told, and I also heard in publishing as well that people thought books like Star Daughter would never sell, that nobody would want them. So let's prove them wrong. Don't just buy my book. Buy other marginalized authors' books. Talk about them. You know, like get the word out. Let people know how how great they are, so that we do come to, uh, to a day when. That's not even a question anymore. Of course, those books are going to sell like anything else. You know, I really want to see that day. And I'm looking like, uh, like we were talking about earlier, I'm really looking forward to seeing how today's budding teen writers help contribute to that. And, uh, and the other part of your question, there's a lot that you don't see from behind the scenes that <laughs> leading up to a book launch. There's, you know, a lot that I have to do. I mean, Harper's been great doing promo. Obviously, their reach is much bigger than mine, but there's still a lot. Uh, there are so many hats I have to wear and and it's been a lot juggling a lot of juggling things that I'm not allowed to talk about yet um, doing events like this which I'm delighted to do you know it's one of the hats that I'm wearing but it, it is a lot and also trying to finish drafting book two hopefully before Star Daughter comes out so then I can just rest a little bit you know it's it's like woo, all the plates in the air which one am I going to drop is it one that won't break when I drop it please and and um but yeah, my August is going to be, assuming that I get the, the draft done in time, everybody, please send me lots of Stardust. It's going to be uh, the launch event. It's going to be a couple other events like that, and a couple video interviews. And uh, I've already done, uh, I've already written blog posts and they're all ready to go, which I'm really glad for that they're, they're all done. But it's, yeah, there's a lot. So, the, but yes, the best thing you can do is, is talk about not just my book, but also other marginalized authors' books like this. Let everybody know they're there, talk about how much you enjoyed them, push them into people's hands. Awesome, yes. Well, I can say that my, that Star Daughter and I have plenty of other books that I need to put, that I need to swap out and put back up on the shelf record and like the staff recommend shelf once I get back to Ithaca. Um, but right now, um, for those of you who are going to be watching this after the fact, after the recordings up, I'm going to be pausing 
the recording um, because for those of you that are here live, we have a special treat for you. This. Um, so that just about concludes the event. Uh, but if you if you have like a really quick question and you can type fast, you can feel free to put it in the chat. Um, but Star Daughter is available for pre-order. Um, you can get it on our website, buffalostreetbooks.com. Um, and I can't stress enough how important pre-orders are for authors. Um, and this is one you're really not gonna wanna miss. Um, and we'll certainly have as soon as it's out, we certainly have a ton of copies in the store, uh, but you can also order it online if you're not, even if you, if you live in Ithaca, if you don't, you can have it delivered straight to your doorstep. Um, and uh, I just, I also want to reiter reiterate what you said uh, about supporting marginalized authors and supporting, you know, um, voices that, that uh, give a perspective other than your own. Um, and it's, important now more than ever that we do that um, and it's important to me to make this week as diverse as possible um, and uh, I'm hoping that that we succeeded in doing that um, but we hope that we see you all here tomorrow for our event with Lila Lee for I'll Be the One um, which is a very different book than Star Daughter but it's, it's a lot of fun um, but yeah I, I can't recommend that you pick up this book more <laughs> that I have. It's, um, you've, you've heard an excerpt of it. Uh, you can see just how, how stunning the prose is and, um, you're in for a real treat. August 11th, is that when it yes. comes out? Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you for pre-ordering both your book and <laughs> Lila's book. Um, and, um, a quick reminder that if you want to take advantage of ordering all seven books featured this week um, from Buffalo Street Books, you can get a 15% discount. Um, and of course, that includes a pre-order of, of Star Daughter, which um, will either ship out August 11th or you can pick it up at the store on August 11th. Um, I think, Regina, do you have anything else you want to add? I just thank you so much for, for joining us and uh, I, I hope that um, I get to see your second book when that comes out um, and I'll definitely be, we've got, we don't have, uh, our budget has been frozen <laughs> because of the, the pandemic, but I am building my list of the things that I'll be buying once we have money again for the library and it's definitely on there and that's exciting. Thank you for having me. Like these are great questions. Yeah, thank you so much for being here and for talking about the book, especially considering that it's not yet uh, on shelves yet, but it will be soon. And I can't wait to get my hands on a finished copy of it and to post pictures of it and to once I get back to Ithaca to put it on um, our staff recommend shelf and to you know put it face out um, in the YA section. It's, it's, it's such a special story and I can't thank you enough for writing it. Um, so I think I, I read it I think at the, the towards the beginning of the year um, right where right before everything kind of <laughs> went south and so it was, it was great to have memories of, of such have reading such a lovely book. Um, thank you that that really that means so much to me thank you. Uh, it's, it's such a wonderful book. Please, please pre-order this book if you haven't already. Um, and that's about all I can say. Just pre-order Star Daughter. Maybe I should like change my, my Twitter handle to spell it says pre-order Star Daughter. <laughs> like nobody follows me on Twitter, so that wouldn't help. <laughs> um, but thank you all so much for being here. Um, yes, thank you. We hope to see you for our so we have two more events left this week. Like we said, we have Lila Lee tomorrow. And then on Saturday, we have Kim Johnson, which is another not quite as big a sneak peek as you got today, but you get a little sneak peek um, with the book that we're featuring on Saturday. Um, yeah, I hope you all have a wonderful night and that you're all staying safe um, and that you pre-order Star Daughter. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.